And that is Michael Ballet weighing in. Michael is uh, the author of the book. The, he is the co-author of the book, The Gold Mine, which is published by LAI, which won a Shingo Award. Hey, Rose. Hello. <laughs> that is the uh, highest uh, honor for a, a lean book. It is the first of a trilogy of three lean business novels co-authored by Michael and his father, Freddie, all of which have won the Shingo and have uh, sold very well. And today we are kicking off the LEI Book Club. And it's just a great privilege to have the author, Michael Bienvenu. Welcome, thank you for Thank you, here. I'm honored. <laughs> uh, let me just, a couple of things. I'm, I wanna get into our conversation. I, I, I'd like to just uh, clarify, we are the Lean Enterprise Institute. It is a nonprofit organization located in Boston, Massachusetts, dedicated to advancing lean thinking and practice and sharing what we learn. It was founded in 1997 by Dr. James Womack. And we fulfill our mission by performing action research directly with companies across industries, and then share that learning through remote training, digital media, podcasts, lean posts, and book publications. Today's event is our first book club, and thank you for joining us. Um, I just want to mention this is uh, being presented as a webinar, and LAI is very excited about its virtual lean, learn exper lean learning experience, aka VLX. There's a link to it on this slide. This is an ongoing shared learning experience with your lean peers. It combines insights from lean leaders across diverse industries about tackling today's problems and provides encouragement and inspiration to make things better. So follow this link, you'll find resources um, there. In terms of today's event, we welcome questions from you. Please, please, please chime in. You have two options. The chat is a place where you can Basically, it's a stream. It is just that a chat. We are going to address questions through the Q&A feature. That is this aspect that's highlighted in red on this slide. And that is where you should leave questions. And in fact, people can vote them up or down. Um, we'll try to respond to the most uh, popular ones and the ones that seem most germane. Um, OK. Again, welcome, Michael. I, I, I have to say, <laughs> I've had the honor of working with Michael for, I don't know, 15 plus years. And yeah, I, I know my books are too long. I know. Let's get it over. Let's get this out of the way, Tom. <laughs> Moi? I, I, I would never say that. <laughs> I've edited. I have to say to everybody that, that Tom is the reason, that, Tom is a secret sauce in the book. Tom is the guy who turns, you know, an okay book into a great book. So he, you, you have to know this now that he's on screen. He, he's the guy doing the real work. Pasha. Listen, uh, it, it is great, great fun work. Now, Michael um, is, is really well known. His books have sold supremely well. The Goldmine has, I don't know, more than 100,000 sales in... Uh, it's been translated into many languages. Tom, do you know that it, sell, that it sells as much in the Chinese versions as the whole world together? Now I do. It's, I wasn't even aware of that. It, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's astonishing. Of course, for the, uh, the size of China, it's a drop in the ocean, but, but, uh, but it's still, uh, uh, to me, it's still a mind boggling number. My takeaway is, is that these really large sales speak to the just relevance of the ideas that there's something in the uh, blend of story and <clears throat> deep knowledge about the, the important stuff about lean that speaks to people. Um, yeah, we were discussing this with a, with a CEO on the Gamba yesterday and, and we have all these books about, you know, people from Netflix and Google say, uh, I'm, I'm the CEO, I've got it, I, I've figured it, figured it out, so now I'm going to share uh, what I know. And I think it's very, very different with Lean because this is not a one-person experience. This is something that's been built across the world 
uh, over 70 years of many gifted engineers. So, so we're looking into a method that is not linked to somebody's talent or genius. And I think that it makes it very unique. Okay. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've always been just fascinated by um, the, just the, the choice to present this as a novel. Um, I, I think. Do, what, do you know the story about that? No. Nope. Do, you know, do you know why it's novel? Because I, when my father retired, I wanted to write a book about his experience and working with him and all these things. And, and I, would, I would write a business book, you know, it's like I, I had in mind, like good to great, something like that. And, and he would just get bored with it. He would just say, nah, nah, not interested. And, and, and the other problem he had is that it's a system we're trying to present. Right. So because it's a system, the moment you break it down linearly into points, you lose the systemic side. You lose the fact that when you push on one side, you have to push on the other, you know? So eventually I came up with the idea of a novel and we, which uh, suddenly interested him and also has a great thing that because you work on the dialogue, for instance, there's this constant tension, tension between flow and quality. And as you work in the dialogue, you say, you know, you can say, uh, you know, Bob Wood says we should do quality and he gets pushback. So he says, okay, let's do flow and then go back to quality. So, so the dialogue is a great way to present the system Right. Because you don't you don't have to go through it point by point. But the truth is that Freddie was just bored with what I wrote. Yeah, and I'm I'm biting my tongue. I I, I kind of want to segue into scheduled matters, but I'm gonna uh, ask you, you know, gee, the book features a very stubborn, um, you know, uh, sensei who. Uh, ends up essentially working with his academic son, Mickey. And uh, I, I wonder if this story had any uh, relation to reality, Michael. Oh, no. Freddie thinks Bob Woods is a wimp. Oh, OK. No, no. Um, it, is, it really is a story. I, I wanted to tell about the experience I had with my father on the Gamba. But what, remember, in the, in the very beginning of the book, uh, the first guy that that pisses Bob Woods off, yep. uh, and Bob Woods says, "Okay, I'm not doing this anymore, and I'm and I'm, you know, and I'm 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 not going back to the factory." Which turns out is actually um, it was very um, with the experience we say this is great because this is what got the rest of the gang to learn by themselves. Okay, and and it, it puts the sensei role in really what it is, you know, to point the way, make people think. And I do things, but uh, when Freddie read it, and when Freddie looked at all the time what Bob Woods actually backs down, he said, "You know, come on." It's that's uh, it. my my father. Just so everybody knows, my father was CEO of a of an uh, auto uh, auto components uh, you know global company. So he <laughs> these these issues were different for him. You know? I'd like to just do a brief segue and talk about what, what, what's in this book. So if there, there might be a few people who have not yet had the chance to read it, and I, I implore them to do so. But basically, the gold mine explores the human challenges of implementing lean principles. It really is a business book about a system of enterprise in which lean is tapped to an act of transformation. Um, from top to bottom, involving everybody. And it, it, it really explains in a lot of detail how you use the necessary tools to gain traction. And it challenges, challenges us to face the tough human issues that inevitably crop up, oops, sorry, when you're doing the work. Um, I'm gonna read a, just a brief passage from one of the study guides we have prepared for the gold mine. There's a, another one that's three parts, but um, the gold mine is an attempt to capture the human challenges facing leaders in the lean transformation. The company in this story is fortunate to work with a sensei, a true sensei taken from the Japanese for teacher, or in this case, master, does more than simply teach. He or she make sure that lean leaders and team members stay on the straight and narrow path of lean outcomes. And 
and that they avoid politics, rationalizations, or other human obstacles. Above all, a sensei helps generate the continuing lean discussion at the heart of continuous improvement. And with that, I'm gonna show one more fun slide that comes from the book. And I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Becca and Cam, I, I hope I've acknowledged that they are part of the fabulous team, Rebecca Whitehouse and Kamana Jane, um, who are with LEI and have done all the supporting work. Can we uh, turn, I'm gonna turn off screen sharing and that should give us a different view. All right, hey, Michael. All righty. Wow, a lot of people here. All right, because I haven't seen that to date. So let's talk a little bit about the book, Michael. And I'm gonna read some of the chapter titles uh, with a little bit of the key um, takeaway from it. And this gives us a chance to kind of give a little precy of what actually happens. So um, the first chapter is called, titled, Profit is, Profit is King, But Cash Rules. And in it, you basically explore the need to understand the true nature of your crisis. So we are introduced to Phil Jenkinson, whose company is just crushed in a cash crisis. And he is overwhelmed and... Um, there's demand for the products and he can basically make a profit when they produce them consistently. But beyond that, he is at a complete loss. And so the narrator of the book is a guy, Mickey Woods, a childhood friend. And he introduces, well, reintroduces Phil to his father, Bob Woods, who along with a crusty pal of his, Harry, uh, challenges Phil with some really kind of focused advice on, on how to see this mess in front of them. So talk about lean as, a, I don't know, a clarifying lens for the business in, in, in forcing a discipline of understanding what, what business problem, what are you trying to uh, Well, one of, the, one of the classic misunderstandings of the book is people think the business story is just context to present the tools. Uh, actually, lean is about business, and it's really about business. It's always been about business, and so so we get into the business problem. Uh, the business problems has two angles. One is the cash crunch, but the other is the fact that it, it it starts with product development because Phil is a brilliant innovator, inventor. He's invented a new product. There's demand for it, and he buys a facility that makes old products. So you have all through the book most of the issues are actually engineering issues. Okay. And all Lean does is reveal these issues. Now, the other thing, it, when, when you read the book again, it's, it's, it's funny how relevant it still is <coughs> on, on the manufacturing side. On the cash crisis, something has happened since, the, since 2008, which is that the finance world has taken over to such extent that you can now hide your cash crisis through refinancing. So right. the pressure we used to have in the 90s to actually get the cash out in order to make the business thrive has uh, largely uh, been uh, hidden in many cases. You know, it, it all started with it all started with Enron and look, the mass G got itself into it and all these things because there, there are many, so many ways now with the, with the, with the funds and the equity houses and all things to, to actually uh, buy and sell the company in the process. You know, the idea is that you hide the debt and you sell it onto somebody else who thinks that they can sell it on somebody else. Yeah. So, so in the business terms, uh, the, it's part of the thing I think that is happening with lean is that cash is less of a burning issue than it was then, but, but, but it really is. So the book is really is a business book. It's about understanding the cash crisis and understanding the future sales crisis through, uh, through handling the old products and developing the new products. And at the, uh, in the book, at some point, if you remember, they, they develop yet another new product and, and they need to handle this, this flow of revenue through the products. Well, what the <clears throat> book does very well 
in the in the first couple chapters is it <clears throat> uh, challenges Phil to truly understand the um, kind of nature of his problem. Like it's a it's it's a cash crisis, but what's what is making that so pressing? And it kind of segues into a chapter um, challenging him to identify the gold in, in the plant and to view the work through the eyes of the customer. Work becomes value when you deliver a product, when you deliver a finished product that a customer actually wants. And they have to start going you know to the factory and and identifying what's actually value adding work and, and what well, is it? what makes the lean so different from any other approach uh, in the beginning of the book this um bob woods is there with his friend harry who used to be he's a retired pur purchasing executive and harry perfectly describes the business crisis Okay. But as people do, he does it in very general terms to say, well, you know, your verities, you know, you, you, you need volume, blah, blah, blah. the more volume you have, the more cost you have, the more crash crunch you have, you have a problem with variety, all these things. But and then, then Phil said, well, if you understand this very well, uh, what do I do? And, and then Harry says, well, actually, I don't know. You have to talk to Bob Woods because most business problems cannot be solved by financial ratios. So what yeah. Bob Woods does, and this is unique to Lean, he so basically they have a backlog of orders they need to deliver, which is why they have the cash crisis because they, they, the cash is out there in the pocket of, of the, the customers earmarked for them. But since they're not delivering, they can't get it to them. So essentially the first thing that Bob Woods does, it goes to the factory and shows them all the components, all the semi-finished things saying, guys, if everything here was magically finished, if the values that are shipped to customers, what shape would be in? And they say, well, it would actually be okay. So very concretely, this is you move from the business generalities to the fact that every single product, you need to move from stage one to stage two and stage two to stage three and say, why is it not done? Why is it not moved to the next stage? And you can all of this and suddenly it becomes a very concrete things you, you can actually do something about. Right, and it's shocking to Phil, the CEO, because he says for, for one, we've already done this with consultants. We've already stripped out the waste. They've already, you know, had a go at this. And, and um, two, it's still striking how much waste is there, how many unfinished products are lying about. The number just goes up and up and up. And yeah, but uh, the thing is that what they've done with consultants is fix the organization. And actually the consultants did a good job, which is the funny part, but they haven't fixed the skill thing. Uh, that when you when you start looking at it, uh, I did recently in a in a in a factory that uh, refurbishes cars. They had cars all over the place, and it, and so I was doing Bob Woods. I was saying well, this car was it not at the next stage? Then this car and this car, and it turns out that every car has a very specific issue that's wrong with it. So it's a skill problem. Uh, you can organize all you want, but if you don't have the people who know how to fix the issue to move the car to the next stage. It, the waste will still be there. And I remember the, the number of people who tried to copy Toyota plants in the auto industry and they, they, they took the Toyota numbers and they copied the plant. And so there's no room for uh, the car hospital. There's no room for inventory. And then you go, the plant is running. It's a mess because people right. don't know how to solve the issues. So the cars are, the, you know, the products are there. So they overflow everywhere. So, so this is the next step, which is um, Bob gets them to realize through the lean tools, that they really have skills issues to move things faster. Well, I, I'm gonna, I, chapter three is called tack time. And basically they are given a challenge of focusing on value adding work for like, I'm, I'm sure I'm mischaracterizing, but basically they're challenged with stabilizing production and uh, identifying and reducing variation and one way that they do this is uh, adopting red bins, which they use to identify and tackle defects that are produced by the system as they occur. So yeah, that's kind so, of a again, first it, step in- It's a system, you have to see the system thing. As long as you do use production rates, you need, we need 40 a week. 
Well, you can produce slowly at the beginning of the week and suddenly catch up at the end or, or the other, and, and, and you still have your production rate. When you talk in terms of tag time, we say like we need to product, produce a product every 10 minutes, something like that. It, it becomes event-based and not work-based. So you have a, an appointment to meet every 10 minutes. So suddenly, uh, why the red bins? Because you can't have the operators doing the rework while they try to keep the rhythm. You can't deal with all these stories. So you do a very lean thing. You start isolating the normal, the way it should be with mm -hmm. the abnormal. And, and this is the talk about sensei skill. The first thing that my father's sensei taught him and then, then he taught me is you, you always look at the world in terms of visualizing normal from abnormal. Visualizing normal these two things from very abnormal. Differently. Okay. So this is what they do. So they, they start going into there and hitting it and separating the red bins is all about visualizing the abnormal and treating them differently. And, and of course you get then into the normal thing, which is at first the abnormal is just silly things that they do in operations, but very quickly they clean it up and they realize the abnormal is that they have some real engineering problems. Right. Right. That they need to solve. Uh, and I, Oh, uh, one thing that you mentioned to me in a conversation we had leading up to this is that the sensei pushes them to set true potential as their target goal. It's a crazy, yes. impossibly high stretch goal that he says, this it's is not, what actually not, you can do. No, no, no. It's not a stretch. It's not a stretch goal. It's not, again, it's, what is, what is true potential? Very, this true potential just, is very pragmatic. Uh, at some point in the book, you have a production analysis board. So in this case, it's, you can do it in any case, but this is very simple with production. You have an hourly target, which is, you know, the best, the best you can do. So you time things, or you, I don't, I never timed anybody, but you ask people to time themselves and, and here's the best time we have to do this job. And then now you suddenly apply this to every job, every day, every week, every month. And you look at the value of production. And this is what Bob Woods is doing very concretely. And, and then you have, wow, you have this enormous gap. So once you have this enormous gap, now you just need to figure out what is it that we do wrong that we can hit our own. It's not set. It's not a smart objective or anything nonsense like this. It's okay. something that you know it's been done. You know you can do it. And this is where the seven wastes of Taishi Ono were so brilliant because once you have this gap, you can start separating already different causes and then you okay. start getting into all these different things. And again, like I think it's chapter four or five, which is called standardized work, which shares the, uh, the famous 5S um, and S standardized work as a means of kind of supporting tack time ensuring built-in quality and uh sure but it becomes if we, if tangible down, ways we're missing to the point. if we go down that route, we're missing the point because we're going Please. back into the tool things and you have to see what happens really and this is why it's it's a novel is yep. that i saw it yesterday i was i'm lucky i'm working with a transformation that's the most gifted uh talented entrepreneur i know and four years down the line uh, we, we're starting to have the first generation of team leaders that have been promoted within the system. And it's amazing. And, and suddenly it's, with, with all we hear about companies, suddenly you see a company where people go and they enjoy, it. you know, it's so positive. The customers uh, bring you, bring the sales, sales lady box of chocolate because they're happy and, and people are full of energy. And, and we, we've, I really think even myself, we've stopped believing that work can be like that. Okay. But it's very interesting how do you go into this. It's what happens in the book. Uh, what needs to be done is not that hard, but you need to understand TPS, fine. So you take the, you learn it. And then you go and talk to somebody and say, hey, do you want to do some TPS? And then essentially they say either yeah or no. Some people say, yeah, sure, let's have a go. And some people say, you know, not on my life, not on my watch, no, no way, no, can't be done. So your transformation is really shaped by your encounters. And what happens in the gold mine, it, it, I remember a question I had early on on Gamba Coach was saying, is there always so much conflict in a lean transformation? And truth is you don't need to, <laughs> what happens and there's a, a lot of people with there's no conflict at all because they, they say, hey, yeah, sure, let's do it. 
But then you hit, hit some people and you have some in the books that you really need to negotiate and persuade them. Yeah. And then you have some people you just have to agree to disagree and they're going to have to move on because they will simply refuse to do everything. So it's really about what Carol Dweck calls a fixed mindset or growth mindset. Yeah. And, and, and your transformation completely depends on who you, on who you hit. So this is not you. You have a method. It's not your method. It's a time and tested method. We know it works. And you go to people and say, hey, do you want to play? And some well, people say, happy to. And some people say, never. And, and this is how the transformation kind of happens. One very, I think, elegant um, uh, aspect of the book is that because it's presented as fiction or a case or what have you, um, it, it very definitely weaves in technical and human challenges. And it really talks about uh, very explicitly how using, say, 5S and standard work um, doesn't simply achieve kind of quality goals, to, but, but it develops esprit de corps, that it's a way of forming teams. And I, I, I wonder if you can talk well, the, about the, I mean, heart, that's... the heart of lean. What, what, what got me interested in lean and the heart of lean is, is the, the day a Toyota engineer told me, you know, a, in order to make good products, you have to develop people. You know, the, the, our thing in manufacturing, we build products is monozukuri, the, 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 the art and the taste and the appetence to make great products. And we do so through what they call hitozukuri, which is developing great people. So it's a long story, but basically it, I, as a sociologist, I was fascinated by Hitozokuri, which is what do you mean by making people? And then it took me, uh, I think five years to realize that I couldn't understand making people if I didn't understand making products. <laughs> so this is how I got into engineering because it's a sentence, you have to do both. And then it took me yet another 10 years before I understand that the sentence worked in reverse that yes, you need to develop great people to make great products, but the way you develop people, which is what it shows in the book, the way you develop people is through getting to work them on products, on monozukuri. So this is really the hard intuition of this, is this, this monozukuri and hitozukuri. And the, the third term, which is rarer to see is kotozukuri, which is the, the management oomph, the leadership oomph to keep people on these two things all the time, cool. Wh which is essentially the debate of the book because the relationship between Bob and Phil builds because they need to keep people on these two things all the time. One interesting part of the book has to do with its definition of leadership. Um, Bob is a big uh, sailor and they go to the marina and they, they watch races and the prepping of races and um, he, um, says he suggests viewing leaders as skippers and not as managers or captains. I mean, this is this speaks to the importance of team leaders and the actual role that that you, you suggest they should be playing. Can you talk about that? Well, the, the, the captain is, the, you know, the, the you know, this captain and there's, there's the Lord Almighty. The captain makes all the decisions and we have a, a skipper in the book, which is a bad skipper. The, so everything is about, he's a bottleneck for everything it has to be everywhere. Make it. So it's really this command and control. This is, this is how we imagine the, the, the military. Actually, the military it turns out has never been like that because they know it doesn't work. A skipper is somebody who builds a team where everybody knows that what they have to do and is on the lookout of abnormal to intervene as a reserve when things okay. are. So yes, the skipper will make tactical choices, important ones. The tactician says we could go right or left, the skipper decides at some point. But most of the time, the skipper does nothing other than watch out that when something goes wrong, he's there ahead of them to help them do this. But there's another issue in the gold mine that I wrote kind of a, as a storyline plot, which I didn't realize how, how important, how true it turned out to be. Now I have more experience. Um, there's this, there's this, character I'm very fond of, and she, she comes in all the books, who's, who's Amy, 
who's the bright spark. She's the she's the life of the party. She's she's the get things done girl. You know, you have all these uh, hapless blokes going on. So oh, I can do this. And Amy just says, I'll oh, just get on and do it. And, and she brings us energy. And she's head of HR at the factory. Well, it's accidental. She used to work in a burger joint. You know, she understands the really practical things. Yeah. And, and, and she leaves the company when it gets interesting. And she completely misses the plot. And we find this out in the subsequent books is that she's completely missed the plot. And I thought it was a fun device that she actually leaves when it gets really interesting. But it turns out that when you do these things, the first step is getting to just-in-time implementation, which they do in the book until the last chapter. But this is just entering the room. So you have two things with the systems. You have setting up the system with the people, but then the real juice is in maintaining the system. And this is a very different skill. So again, this is a bit different. You know, people, you have to learn this. So it's funny because the, the real work and Phil, when you meet Phil in the next book, he's a transformed guy. Right. Uh, you know, here, here he's this hapless puppy lost guy. And he comes across in the next book, he looks like Bruce Wayne, you know, and Batman, you know, he's a terrifying guy who knows what he's doing. But the transformation of Phil is not during the setting up of the lean. This is just the beginning. The transformation is learning the skills that once yep. you've got the system working, how do you maintain them? And how do you keep people on this monozukuri, hitozukuri, monozukuri, hitozukuri cycle when they're not setting up a new tool or doing something new and shiny? And I, I think I, I'm going to ask one, one final question directly to you and then segue to questions. But um, I forget if it's the final or the penultimate chapter called the Hijunka Way, where uh, Bob Woods departs. He said, my work is done. It's on you now, Phil. And he basically says to Phil, your job now is to see the big picture, to understand this as a system, to understand the relationship between the JIT shop floor and your MRP, to maintain- Except that it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work out that way, it does it. Because remember what happens then. So Listen. Bob Wood says, okay, this is done. You're on your own. And then his old friend, his old sensei from Japan comes. Right, right. And so they go and pick up at the airport and they're all very friendly. It's all beers and stuff because they have so much history. And the sensei comes into the factory and says, huh? You've done this all wrong. <laughs> it's like, Why are you doing this all wrong? Bob, son, what are you doing? You know, what, you know, what, bah, bah. <laughs> and, and you go, what? Right. And this, I mean, this is such a lean experience. And this is fantastic. What I didn't realize at the time, which is the moment that you switch from setting up the just in time system, which is just a system, to actually working the Kaizen to really get X. This is, this is the Jim Collins good to great moment. And it turns out again that again uh, in the in the lean manager Bob Woods is still very much present, but he's in very different presence. Uh, Phil is doing the work, and Bob is his friend, and they actually have fun. And, and the character then is the hapless again, uh, you know, Andy Ward, uh, plant manager who's who's who has to deal with all these and has these two jokers. You're just having right. fun with it, right? So, right. so, so which, which is exactly what happened with Bob Woods and his sensei. So, so, so we're saying something. And to conclude, before we go to questions, I'd like to say that one thing I'm only very recently learning. I, from the start, from working with my father from the gold mine, I realized that you couldn't do lean with consultants. Uh, you have to have a sensei mentoring the CEO. The CEO needs to understand the system. Okay. But we're so captivated, we're so captured, conditioned by this idea of execution that I thought that the CEO gets it and then gets his guys to execute. I didn't realize that in the real transformation, I've been lucky, I've been working with, uh, say, I don't know, a dozen real transformations. What really works is when the line of mentoring is happening when the CEO mentors somebody and then they mentor somebody else. And so, so you have a tradition of learning and this is really where miracles happen. So again, we're very, very, we were so conditioned by this idea that somebody, Taylor is that somebody thinks and the rest do, mm -hmm. that we find it so hard to get into this thing. No, it's really about everybody learning every day. Right.
right, 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 right. Um, that <clears throat> it's more important to develop problem solvers than to solve problems. Uh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna and uh, and, and to be honest, it's, it's not just problem solvers because. Uh, it gets a bit tricky. If you just develop solve problem solvers, you're digging a hole in the sand. Everybody can find new problems to solve. You need problem solvers, but you need to give them the line of sight towards the customer value. That's uh, Tracy, Tracy's term. I love it. It's uh, Tracy Richardson's term, line yeah. of sight. So, so the whole visual system is there to tell you what a problem is or not. The Kanban is there to tell you what a problem is or not for the, the customer. And I was lucky to talk to Mr. Harada before he passed passed away. And he, he had a great definition of Kaizen, which is bring value closer to the customer. So it's not just problem solvers. We need absolute problem solvers. People are so much better if they feel confident in their team, in their own ability to solve problems, and in the fact that the company will give them systems that work. Mm -hmm. The recipe for happy people at work. They, so they solve problems but they need a line of sight, which is what the lean system gives them, that they understand which problem is value to customer. So in the lean transformations I worked in, uh, people who join because they say, oh, fine. I, I had this experience as people say, I want to join this company because it's a lean company. Uh, they are very surprised because we're certainly not trying to do everything well. Right. And a lot of things don't work. Right. And a lot of things are messy and there's administration and also thing, and you still have to do the expense accounts and there's a lot of irritation. But but the the collective is focused on always solving value problems for customers, which makes such a difference. It's got meaning. And and if I would write the book again, I would say the theory now that was clear to me is how you make sense making. It has to, you have to show sense as the uh, CEO what you're trying to do so that people can find meaning making. What does it mean for me right, as right, personal? Right. Where, where's the, what's in it for me? Okay. And thirdly, how do they have the resources to face the problems? And when you start aligning these three things, I mean, truly really impressive things start to happen. Let's take some questions. Um, uh, just so folks know, some of them have been shared by uh, Becca Whitehouse of LAI. And we are not just trying to see the clouds. These are questions that came in advance of the event from people who are participating. And we're, we just wanted to give those uh, questions um, airtime. And the one that is uh, at the top of the list right now is a participant asks, why, why do you feel that there's a shortage of true lean adoption at an organizational scale? And before you answer, feel free to uh, drag in any lessons from this book as you see fit? Two things. Uh, first, something we knew back at the time is we have a sensei bottleneck. We sensei don't have enough bottleneck. sensei. We have a sensei bottleneck. Toyota has a sensei bottleneck, okay. just as they have a chief engineer bottleneck. Uh, at some point, it's again, you need, you, you need people who know what they're doing. Uh, first thing. Second thing is, again, I think something has to happen with the finance-driven world that performance is not so much as an issue as a storytelling. So the, oh, again, it's in the book. Okay. In the book, basically, the sense is, you know, there's nothing very complicated with what jo Bob Woods is asking, but, but to people say, no, it's a change. You know, this is how my role is. This is how I'm, I'm attached to the way things are. And, and, and to Bob's credit, he understands it perfectly. He's just being, you know, he just doesn't want to deal with it. But he, we understand people are attached to how they work. Please give in and try something new. Now, what has changed now is, again, um, people have been very discouraged on the shop floor through the fact that now you solve all these company problems through financing and performance is less of an issue, really, as opposed to storytelling. So when you tell people you need to give up the way you're, what you're attached to in the way you work to try something new um the, the pressure is more on say listen why why bother you know please don't talk to me like this please don't tell me to change my mind please and and you get these very very things i mean the senses i knew used to be very respectful of you as a growing person and very disrespectful of, of you as a fixed person so there's been a lot of talk about leading with respect and, and we, well, we, we wrote a book together, Tom, on this. And 
that but what respect is respect for your development respect of you for a future person and and i think the culture has really moved on respect is like at the moment you say something wrong it's such a drama that that people stop you from going to the next step where you want to go yeah yeah and i i, I think my big takeaway from this third book in the, in the goal mind trilogy lead with respect lead with respect is the way it, it says it's not a question of etiquette so much as it's a mindful approach to managing and leading people so that um, your work is designed to support people in doing their best work, yeah. creating the right and, conditions. And again, there's this whole thing about it's tough. It, it does not talk with everybody. It's actually fun with a lot of people because they just say, you know, you just have these conversations, say, oh, we could do this, we could do that, it's fun. But, but, but then it's tough when somebody says, you know, just don't talk to me like this. Don't challenge my work. Don't criticize me in any way. And then you say, uh, okay, uh, goodbye. You know, what, you know. And Bob Woods, the sensei comes to the, um, uh, appears already just fed up with a lifetime of, of facing. Yeah, uh, this, no, he this, definitely this. is. He's retired, Resistance. he's retired. He's actually, actually in the book, he failed uh, his last transformation. He didn't get the job he wanted and he left in a huff and he retired. And now, now he's decided he'll never, never set foot in the plant again. And, yeah. and Phil, Phil is actually a pretty good negotiator because with his hand dog, you know, whiny way, you know, he, he touches the old man's, you know. He, he draws him out. He, he draws he, him out. Yeah, and, yeah. and the narrator is actually jealous because, you know, suddenly he sees his, his father building this relationship with his best friend around yeah. what interests his father, which is production, where yes. his father was never interested in all this, what's the, what this being a professor of psychology, you know. Uh, Michael, the, the, the poor, poor son, Mickey, in the book, whose sensei father uh, doesn't uh, come on, he gets the girl. Respect. He gets the girl. <laughs> he gets the girl, you know. Moving on, Ian Yell has uh, asked, what, what would you say is the biggest challenge faced when trying to improve processes, uh, processes in a business He doesn't get the girl. The, the, the girl gets him. She, when, when you think back at the story, it's very much her decision, actually. So noted. So noted. And I, I also want to just thank people very, very much for their questions. Keep them coming. So again, what would you say is the biggest challenge faced when trying to improve processes in a business environment? The, I, wrote a book, I wrote a book on process improvement and I wish I could recall it. I don't think there is process improvement. There's people improvement. You know, processes is what people do. A process is the result of what people do. Uh, improving the process is, is uh, okay, fine. If you are manufacturing steel parts with robots, yes, you will improve the process. Beyond that, um, it's improving how people understand their work and improving their insights into their methods, their initiatives and how they work together. That's what makes these incredible results. Not improving the process. The process is the people. The process is always a problem and the people are always a solution. But so one interesting thing in the book is that it introduces this famous tool of value stream mapping very late in the book, very late in the transformation. And you say that it's Toyota, a misunderstanding. Toyota frequently does it. I, it's a I, misunderstanding on what the tools are. The tools are ways to visualize what is really there. There are analysis methods you give to people so that they understand themselves what they do. But okay, slow down, it, slow down. Even repeat that. I'm sorry. The, all the tools are just visualization of what's actually happening. That's all they are. They, they are not process improvement tools. You visualize. It's like a microscope or a telescope. You visualize what is there and you don't do it yourself to fix it. You give it to the people, say, hey, take this analysis, take, do this, whether value stream mapping or whether this or that, take this, do your own analysis, come up with your own insights and your own suggestions. Okay, if I may interject, and uh, forgive me if I'm interrupting, but uh, you worked on another book, The Lean Strategy, and I don't want to digress too much, but one of the key uh, messages in that was a, a kind of reframing of what 
uh, lean system or TPS does. Uh, you had a 4F model that um, uh, states that the key thing is finding, facing, framing problems that it, it says the, the real work, the, the magic of this is having a comprehensive approach that's shared by top to bottom where people are actively motivated, rewarded, engaged in finding problems and loving this left-hand side of, a, of an A3. Yep. And I just relate that key idea to this question again about trying to improve processes. Well, for instance, at some point, Bob goes back to the factory and, and goes on about presses. They don't want to do anything about it. And he just goes in and, and says, OK, do some stuff. He's not fixing anything. He's getting them to do some stuff to find what's the real problem with the presses. So it's all this thing about cleaning the window. And we're back to the thing that Amy didn't get. She, she enjoys the cleaning the window part. Because she's from HR, she doesn't enjoy the engineering technical part. Once you've cleaned the window, you have to go in there and engineer the problems out. <laughs> you know, you have to do the work. So uh, people easily confuse both. So the lean tools we know is just clean the window, clean the window, see it as it is, start with what it is, give them light of sight, get the energy going, get people to share ideas. And the other big lean thing is that some people, some problems like, like Phil at the beginning, the problem seems unsolvable. How yes. do we recover from the pandemic? How do we tackle climate change? These are unsolvable problems. One of the great lessons from Toyota is like, when you have an unsolvable problem, start with lots of local countermeasures and bring people together. You will not solve the unsolvable problem, but you will understand it much better. And out of this understanding, it really new things, things you had not expected at all will come. So you're solving local countermeasures, not transactionally for the short-term gains, but rather- Both, to... both, both, both. both. Okay. Both, because we need, usually when we have a burning crisis, we need, that's what happens in the gold mine, we need gains now. And so you're solving real problems now, but, but you don't intend to solve the problem by fixing it. You intend to solve the problem by understanding it. Hey, okay, very cool. Let's, let's just, let's work our way through the questions. I, I have to say, again, thank you people for sharing them. Uh, let's, let's honor you by getting to them. Lana Brew. Uh, says the book focuses on manufacturing aspects. Do you have any comments on how we can translate this into a distribution setting where it is next day delivery and orders um, come in the day before? Similar to Amazon, except we have to possibly cut and repackage the product. Are there some key points to think about? And I, I'm going to just say, yeah, you don't, I don't think you need to solve this specific problem, but maybe address the underlying question of how- That's an interesting that take lessons. on the book because if you remember, uh, half the book is about logistics. The mm -hmm. way they solve the manufacturing problem is solving the logistical problem. To explain with more detail. Well, remember at the first they have to create, they, they have to look at uh, shipping and you know they have this whole thing about the apples and the pears and everything. It's all about internal logistics. It's all a logistical problem, again, to reveal where the engineering problems are. So manufacturing is the test method for your engineering, because engineering is where value is put in for customers. In order to understand the test method, you have to clean up the logistics so you can look at parts being made one by one. To answer the question uh, in a different way, I've never seen a place yet where TPS, mm -hmm. understanding the TPS doesn't apply, not because we're gonna apply TPS, but if you teach TPS, if you mentor TPS to people, whatever they do, they'll come up with things to improve and you'll be surprised. I've worked a lot in hospitals. I worked, I worked with, there was a question I saw, I work with a pure play software house. Uh, they're doing fantastic Kaizen work. Uh, it's really interesting. So we're really looking into the code and say, why is this thing quicker on the PC than on a, on a Mac? And why do this request, why is this slow? And where are, why is this weak for security? It's yep. really very detailed Kaizen work. And what it is, is really is the CEO and the CTO 
have taken on board the, the TPS, are starting to teach them to the people. And I am so surprised with what comes out every time. And they've come up with an adaptation of, of the MIFA, the material information flow analysis that works for systems. And, and we, we, we're starting to, to, to you know, we, we do QFD matrices on systems and it's fascinating. So okay. it's not the application that counts. Okay. It's okay. the very act of teaching and learning the TPS that opens up people's minds, creates insights, creates initiatives and, and generates creativity. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the questions keep coming. Um, lean unearths hidden problems. This is one that came in in advance, but what if the problems um, are seen as negative in the existing organizational culture? Ouch, move on. But I, I mean, isn't that the case? Isn't that where, you, you know? <laughs> Culture is resource. What is our main resource we feed on? Re, you know, tools, what are the tools we use? Um, norms, what is good, what is bad? Rituals. Kind of sums up culture and concepts. So, if you take a step back at some point and you have a cultural issue, you break it down. Where's the issue? In this case, it's a norm. And, and yes, yes, you tackle it head up and head front and what Toyota did to them when you listen to the stories of Georgetown, what the Japanese did is teach people problems first. That's their first thing. And the last thing, problems first, turn yeah. problem into a good thing. And they, they started with undone call up with the problem. And I remember the story of uh, Fujiojo telling the story at first when people pulled the hand on, we asked everybody to clap. It, you need to turn around the norm. The, a yeah. norm is what is good is what is bad. Yeah. So um, I'm not saying that's, that's pretty simple, but I'm not saying that's easy. And again, again, this is easier when you know what you're doing in terms of understanding what you have in front of you. Uh, having to overturn a norm is not easy. I was talking about this pure play uh, company. We, 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 we had to overturn norms in terms of um, uh, Kaizen being put into promotion plans and pay plans and things like that. And, and people are very attached to these norms and that's not necessarily easy. Again, when you understand it, okay, you do it, but it's not easy. Excellent. Um... Uh, excuse me, I'm just perusing the uh, the questions that come in, and I, I'm going to suggest that um, I we're not going to get to all the questions, which, which is uh, an, a result of the, the, the guys. Good guys, ones. I'm doing a video series called you know Ask Me Anything on Video with with some chaps in Brazil, so I think uh, where can they I, find? I take, I take the questions. We'll answer them. Try to at least. So we'll get to the questions. Yeah, and, and we'll find ways on the LAI site through uh, future lean posts or uh, some way. Uh, we, again, forgive me for repetition, but I'm really grateful that people are engaging with these excellent questions. Um, so what's uh, Stefan Bone um, says, what's the best way to start the journey to become a real lean factory or organization. It, it can't be 5S, he says, true? Okay, no, it's a book club. We have a fantastic story in Norway we, um, because I was there one day and, and we went with the, with the plant manager on the factory and say, well, okay, what do we do now? And say, okay, start a book club. So you start a book club. And uh, the next step is you find a sensei and that's part of the journey, finding the right sensei for you. Okay. And then you're away. I uh, am going to go so far as to suggest a few books, if I may. 
Excuse me. Is that showing up? Absolutely. Can people see these uh, lovely books? I do want folks to know that The Gold Mine is the first book of a three book trilogy. It is followed by The Lean Manager, a very uh, comprehensive and complete story. That and long. And very, very freaking long. Um, and it. Guys, it's it, my best book. It's my best book. They mistrust any author who says that, but uh, authors can, are, are disqualified from saying that. Um, as his editor, I'm going to say "Lead with Respect" is the best. It's it's it, it's a lovely continuation. It's just the one you pared down most. This is the Tom and Michael show now. Forgive me. Um, "Lead with Respect" deals with a very fundamental issue at the core of practicing lean, and we have additionally uh, produced a study guide to the three books, which I, lead, I think lead with, "Lead with Respect" is fun because it's in a software company. Exactly. It's a very different setting. Exactly. And the study guide, which is available from LAI, please, please um, avail yourself of this, just helps structure conversation. It breaks the ideas down into chapters and really tries to the respect the nature of a, of a, of a book club. Uh, I think, Michael, the word you use is uh, jishu, jishu ken. I, I know Mark Reich. Self-study. Self -study. Mark Reich has written about that very thoughtfully for LAI. Uh, the importance of self-study. In, in fact, I'm I'm actually going to be disciplined and keep to our 3 p.m. halt day. Tell me 60 seconds about um, what Jishukin is and why it matters. Well, we're back to the fact that we're trying to create a learning environment so everybody has their work ties in. And then uh, sort of their work standards, and then everybody has a self-study, like a project to learn. And, and so self-study. And, and I think it's great that you did uh, show my books for, for the book club. But honestly, guys, you know, any book will do. It's the fact of having a book club that commits your team to learning together. That, that's what gets you in the room. I just want to keep this slide up there for a minute. What we're trying to do is somehow help support an ongoing conversation about the ideas in these books. And uh, we formed a LinkedIn group, the LAI Book Club group, and there's a link to that. And we have also formed a Slack Book Club channel. And this is really an experiment. I, I, I have to say I'm still learning what the, the best way to see the clouds, to create an environment where people feel comfortable kind of sharing ideas and uh, not to be too promotional. It, it really helps if you read the books. So I do hope people will read these books. And um, with that, I'm going to remind folks that to save the date of July 15th, um, on that date, we are offering our next free webinar, which is how to use lean accounting to help design profitable value streams. Additionally, it's not too late to subscribe to join our next VLX seminar, which starts June 21, which is another feature uh, you will get from LAI. And uh, with that, I have us at 3 p.m. And I, I'm just going to stick to the promise we made and uh, stop there. And what I am going to do is just uh, ask everybody, keep, just keep following us, whether it's through those groups or the LAI site. Um, Michael will respond to your questions. And um, please read the books. Uh, I'm I, I just saying that it's not just a kind of a tout. I, I, I think, Michael, I think you and Freddie did a great job. And, uh, it, it taught me and you and you i mean we, we did it's a team effort we did a great job it it, it I, just to close it off for me it was a, one of the powerful ways that i learned about lean I, I i 
was forced to learn stuff that was a little alien and yet made a lot of common sense. Um, and it's well worth the length, each of them, um, but they're, they're very good. So um, I believe that covers everything. Um, I want to thank everyone who came. And Absolutely. I want to thank Becca and Cam. Um, I know John Cotter of LAI. Hey, God, Cam, oh, thank you. Thank you, Pat Pancheck, for a lot of behind the scenes support with this. It, it really helped me. And um, thank you, Michael. Give our, give our best to Freddie, your co-author. Will do, will do. And uh, with that, we are out. So thank Bye, you guys. very much, everyone. Enjoy the evening. Bye. Thank you.